In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson explains the relation between primates and the social world. When you, when you think about the nature of experience, then you think, well, the, ex the nature of experience is quite different for, quite di for different sorts of creatures. And one of the primary differences between creatures is the degree to which they're capable of social interaction and then of complex social interaction. And primates, generally speaking, are very social creatures. They live in troops or packs like dogs, which is why we can get along with dogs, because we understand each other being hierarchical troop animals. We understand dogs and they understand us and they can fit right in pretty much. And uh, we're very, very good at figuring out where we are in the troop. And by we, I mean primates. I mean us going back a very, very long period of time. You know, monkeys and chimpanzees have very sophisticated knowledge of the social structure surrounding them. They know who's who, and they know what status they are. They know what rank they are, essentially. And that's also the case with people. And so one of the things that you might say about people is that our reality isn't nature exactly. It's culture. Now, you can make the argument that you can't really distinguish nature from culture, and I, I believe that that's true and untrue, in a sense. You, I think you can talk about the human and non-human elements of reality, and you can identify the human elements of reality as culture, even though culture is so old that you can also think about it as an inevitable part of nature. So anyway, so most of our experience in our evolutionary past at least, let's say, for the last several million years, we might as well go back to when the ancestors of humans hypothetically split off from the ancestors of chimpanzees. You know, and, and people know very accurately when these sorts of splits occur, by the way, because what they do is they have some sense of the rate of transformation of DNA. You know, it's like a, it, it transforms at a rate that's fairly constant across time, and so then if you take two creatures and you determine how much genetic similarity there is between them and how much difference you can calculate how far back they, they uh, diverged. And so, you know, the fossil record helps with that, although it's very sparse, but the DNA record, it's not really sparse at all in some sense, and so you can be very accurate about We can even tell when people evolved or, or learned to wear clothing. And the reason we can tell that is because there's certain kinds of lice that can only live on clothing and they seem to have diverged from the lice that live in hair about 50,000 years ago, something like that. And so the hypothesis is, well, we must have been figuring out how to wear clothes at that point because the lice figured out how to live in it. So, you know, it probably took them a little while, but I doubt if it took them very long. You know, those little, little creatures that breed fast, man, those things can evolve quickly, much to our dismay. So, okay, so... A big part of the experiential field of advanced primates is the social world. And so we could call that the primate world, and then we could also say that another big part of their experience is the non-primate world, which would be, roughly speaking, the natural world. And then we could also say that the other element of their experience, the other elements of their experience that are very constant is their subjective being. And we don't know much about the subjective being of of creatures like chimpanzees, although you can, you can understand, I think, the subjective being of a dog well enough to befriend the dog, and so you have some insight, and I think it's also reasonable to assume that, I mean, for a long time people were unwilling to admit that animals, well, had a soul, that was the first problem, but after that, that they were conscious, and even the behaviorists fought that notion, but I think the simplest thing to do is to assume that animals and human beings are the same, except when you can prove that they're different, because we share so much of our evolutionary past that the logical inference is that if you think a dog is doing something that's sort of like you would do in that situation, and feeling that way, it probably is, with certain exceptions for species difference. And if that wasn't the case, I don't think that you could have a relationship with a dog or cat. You can't have much of a relationship with a lizard, although there are lizards... There are lizards, uh, bearded dragons in particular, that are social. They like to lay on top of each other, and they hang around together. And you can actually have more of a relationship with them, and apparently the same is true of iguanas. So you can go quite a ways back in the evolutionary, you know, backwards in evolutionary time, and still have enough similarity between you and the creature that you're interacting with so that you can get a pretty good sense of 
at least some element of their, their being. And so the idea that subjective, our subjectivity, is a very ancient part of our experience it seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable supposition. We certainly know that it's been around in all likelihood for at least 150,000 years on the conservative side because there have been human beings that are essentially identical to us from a genetic perspective going back 150,000 years. But I think you'd have to be a pretty harsh judge to assume that higher order primates like chimps don't have some consciousness and, you know, and, and some limited self-consciousness. You know, if you mark a chimp's nose with lipstick and then show it a mirror, it will at least sometimes take the lipstick off its nose. Although I've seen a gorilla try to fight with a mirror, which, well, not I haven't personally seen that. Um, but I've seen a very good video of that happening. But I think the gorilla would eventually figure out that it was, that it was him in the mirror. Um, dogs will recognize them, a dog in the mirror, but they seem to learn to ignore their reflection very, very rapidly. And I don't know if that means that they have a rudimentary self-consciousness and they, they figure out that that dog is them or if the dog just doesn't smell like a, a dog and then the dog thinks, well, it can't be a dog because it doesn't smell like a dog. And dogs probably think that something is a dog because of how it smells and not because of how it looks. You know, so that's why I think that's why dogs don't seem to have any sense of relative size because you can get a chimp, you know, a little chihuahua barking like mad at a Great Dane. You think, really, you know, it's like, you're, that's, that's going to work, is it? But the dog doesn't seem to have a clue about that. Like, he's perfectly happy. And the Great Dane, weirdly enough, will often back off. So, anyways. Okay. So, we've been in a social world, a deeply social world for a long time. And I'm also going to make the presupposition that we've been in a stratified social world for a very long period of time. And I think that you could call that, if you wanted to, and I would never want to, by the way, you could call that the patriarchy. Um, I think that I wouldn't call it that because that's not what it is. But I think that the fact that it's called that and that that's accepted as a reasonable representation is actually a consequence of the action of an archetype. And the archetype is that it's the archetype of the terrible great father, actually, because you think well, there's a social structure with striations in it, and that has advantages and disadvantages, and the advantages are you can live in it, and the disadvantages are you have to follow the damn rules, and they might not necessarily be to your individual benefit. So within a social dominance hierarchy, there's always a bifurcated... It also always has bifurcated significance. It can be good and is good insofar as it protects you from, say, from threat from without, you know, maybe from, from other primates invading your territory, for example. But it also can be a very dismal structure for if you happen to be at the bottom of the hierarchy. So, so anyways, as far as I can tell, that dominant structure is typically represented as masculine. And I, I think the reason for that, although I'm not absolutely certain of this, I think the reason for that is that our social hierarchies are probably more like chimp social hierarchies than they are like bonobo social hierarchies. So the bonobos are a kind of a strange breed of chimps. I don't know how many of you know about them, but the bonobos are extraordinarily sexual and they use sex pretty much as a standard means of communication and tension reduction. And um, there's a lot of sex between the females in the bonobo troops, and they, the use of sex seems to bond them together in a way that keeps male aggression under control, which is quite interesting. And so, but in the chimps, the, the fundamental dominance hierarchy is male, although there's a female dominance hierarchy as well, and some females can certainly be more dominant than some males, but the fundamental structure seems to be male. And then I would also say, well, it's probably dependent to some degree in the primate community and in and other social animals on other factors. So we know, for example, that the, the, the gender that has the highest level of testosterone tends to be the dominant gender. And so in hyenas, the females have larger, have higher levels of testosterone. They're actually bigger and more aggressive than the males, and the price they pay for that is that they have to give birth through a structure that's very much like a penis, which is not the world's most pleasant experience and might account for the hyena's temper. 